Welcome to our Q&A session. It's an opportunity for us to ask any questions about the message that was preached today, the sermon uh, today, our questions about city church, our practices, things you've seen observed, or about things in Christianity in general. My name is Akiemi, and this is... Awesome. All right. The man who needs a mic... Oh, he has a microphone. And there should be a roving microphone... Around who has Sorry. who's holding the conch? Okay, and so uh, the microphone will come to you. If you have any questions in the room, there are some have some have already come in uh, online. But if you have any question in the room, just signify, and Ben will bring the microphone to you. You will not be allowed to hold on to it, but you can ask your question. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Morning. I have uh, plenty of questions, but I'll ask just one today. Thank so you. So it's about um, female leadership in church. So in the Bible, there are a couple of um, prophetesses here and there, but it would look like they didn't particularly had a congregation, sort of. So is there, is there, is there, okay, let me ask in this context. Is there a special anointing for men that can mount the pulpit? Or is there a rule or a law that says women cannot mount the pulpit in the Bible? Or that, or lead a congregation in the in the Bible, because even now we would say that, except for few cases, churches leadership is predominantly men. Thanks, okay. Adiza. Thank Easy you. question there. <laughs> okay, we have about three already, I think. <clears throat> yes, three on here, and um, Hadiza. Uh, any other person in the room? Right here. Yes. Um, my question is on today's sermon. So the speaker made reference to um, a sentence which he said, pray, pray, prayerless equals powerless, which automatically mean more prayer, more power. So it seems to me that um, we were peace. Well, let me not say, let me not assume, but I feel like what it meant to me was that power is in my prayer not really in the God that is answering the prayer. And again, I would also want to know what's the place of the sovereignty of God, where he does has, as he wants to and as he wills, you know, according to his perfect plan. Thanks. Easy question. For the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, I'll read some of the ones that are here because I think we would have about five questions already. Yes. Um, one, the first one says, is there anything wrong with being a market speculator? Is there anything wrong in buying the dollar in the hope that the Naira will be devalued so I can sell at a higher price? In fact, can I borrow from... Wow, this person wants financial advice. Can I borrow from GT Bank at 1.33% per month, forecasting that in two months that Naira would have devalued by 11% so I can make gains? Check me, show me. Well done. Well played. <laughs> That's crowdsourcing your, uh, your trading strategy. All right. Awesome. Check me. We'll, we'll come to you. Um, uh, second one, baptism. Baptism doesn't save, but scripture commands it. Please, can you help explain why in some passages of the Bible it sounds as if it's saying we are saved by baptism? What is baptism and in what sense is it efficacious? Nice word. And this water symbolizes, so he now quotes, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First Peter 3.21. Okay. And it goes again. It says, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. I obey me. Some of your answer, some of your, the answer to your question is already contained in that second Peter. But I think we'll refer you to some others' uh, answers. All right. Third question. What was your process in believing a more complementarian view of gender roles in church? like what was your process like did you always hold this position or did you come to this position was it difficult to accept thank you that's for pastor femi that's the, where is it you you know no, nobody up here uh, uh, all right but um it, it kind of yeah <laughs> it ties it pastor ties femi is in the room but he's on leave so technically uh, it ties into hadiza's question yes yeah, so, so that's, that's helpful take, take, take it together okay yeah. 
And, and so we'll take that together. That's absolutely okay. correct. Yeah. I will. I will. I'll start with the, uh, maybe I'll take the first one on market speculation okay. because it sounds innocuous, but it's actually. I think it's actually it makes it, it can be helpful for how we conceive of um, sort of our lives as Christians under a nation. So I would say first of all, you should never bet against your country. You should never do anything with the intention that your country will be harmed. Never. We are not um, where we were by mistake. Uh, Acts tells us that God placed us in our nation with our parents and our families so that we may seek him and perhaps find him, right? And in, in him we live and move. Though it's not far from us because in him we live and move and have our being that famous song. It's saying there's intentionality about the family you're born in, the nation that you are born in. Born in. Uh, as Christians in many parts of scripture we're referred to as aliens, pilgrims, um, what other word? Saying our citizenship Strangers. is in heaven and that we're temporarily here. And he also calls us ambassadors representing God. And then, and when we look at the imagery and the, the commands for pilgrims, for sojourners, for immigrants everywhere, it says, uh, and for those who are even in captivity, it says pray for the nation that you are in, even if you are in captivity. Pray for the nation that you're a pilgrim in. Pray that for its flourishing. Pray that it goes well for you, right? Uh, because even for those who are dead temporarily, because God wants to preserve them so that when it's time, he can take them out of the land. But he doesn't want them to suffer in the land in which they're, they're pilgrims. And so for us to, uh, and the Bible says we should pray for our leaders and people in authority so we may live peaceful and godly lives uh, so that the gospel may be spread apart. The reason why we want peace, why we don't like insecurity, it's not, it's not just that we want comfort. It's also so that we can do the work of the gospel and preach the gospel. So those of us who are in peaceful environments who are not preaching the gospel, you're missing a trick. You're actually wasting a lot of time. But God, all this is saying, is given, painting a picture of how we should look at our lives under a nation. We should want it to flourish. We should want things to be better. Now, I'll talk about, you know, very quickly about financial instruments. They are neutral. They are very, very neutral. Instruments are neutral. It's how we use them. And the way this question was positioned, it's actually spoken about in a lot of economics classes. A market speculator is someone who essentially because of bad economic policies of a country, says, I'm going to not only exploit this, I'm going to attack, 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 uh, and, and I'm going to make a profit in there. And you can see, and this is well studied in what happened to the Asian tigers, uh, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, one other country, where, you know, George Soros, you know, who is now the object of all manner of conspiracy theories. A lot of them went. Now, it's true that the countries were a bit foolish in the way they were running their policies, but if you think about what happened after currency speculators attacked uh, the Asian uh, markets, they were destabilized. They went to poverty, they went to the IMF, World Bank loans and things. It was hard for those countries for many, many years. How do you, how do you take a place where you rejoice that I made money off of that destruction? Now, those same instruments that are available for <laughs> traders, if you're in, 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 the, in, in that field, they're people who are referred to as hedgers, as opposed to speculators, who have portfolios who have investments right that are that they of course they, they desire for those investments to perform in a certain way but because of these same bad economic policies they anticipate that the value of their portfolio will fall in the future so they use these instruments to hedge that if if your bad policies affect you know my assets then i can make some money to recover from what i have that's a completely different mindset same instrument you may take similar positions but intentions are completely different. And so, to Shegun and your question, if you're in Nigeria and we talk about the hardship that we're experiencing, and you have financial assets, you have portfolio, you have all those things, you want to pay school fees, your kids may be going abroad down the line, you may be in business, you want to import, you need naira and you, know, and you need dollars, and the, naira, you know, the economic policies are not very good. You can utilize what is in front of you to protect yourself, to protect your portfolio, to care, to anticipate what may happen next year so that you can do what is needful for your family or for your business. Completely different mindset from speculating, attacking, hoping to profit, and hoping, actually hoping, that the Naira will be devalued in two months. That is, you know, you know that is unconscionable. And as Christians, it's not what's legal. We think about what morality, the field of morality, the field of ethics, we draw it from what the Bible says about us and our lives here on this planet. And so I would say, you shouldn't. I would say that you should look for a healthier way to um, protect yourself. You should, you should conceive of the way you want to use those instruments very, very differently and come to a place where you can be at peace with God. 
Okay. Thanks, Uncle Wai. Very, very insightful. Um, I'm going to attempt to answer Hadiza's question and um, Bolu Atifer's question. So just to remind us again, Hadiza's question is, um, so basically, is there a difference between males and females? Or is, so is there, is there more anointing for men that they can preach the word of God that women can't uh, do that? Okay, head a congregation, yes. Particularly when you look at the Old Testament, you see certain female characters, Deborah, you know, and all of those who, who led in the Bible. Um, and that ties into Bolu Atifer's question. It says, what was your process to believing a more complementary view of gender roles in church? What was it like? Did you always hold this position or did you come to this position? Was it difficult to accept? Um, so let me start by saying, there are, some, there are some things that for you to believe, you ha for, for you to be a Christian, you have to believe. Like you cannot be, you, there's no disagreement on, on these ones. The divinity of Jesus Christ. And so that's where, for instance, we draw the line between um, Christians and, for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses because they say Jesus wasn't divine. He hasn't always been divine. He was an angel who died and then eventually became God's son. So you, you, you cannot be a Christian. You, the Bible draws the line on that. Um, the Trinity, the Bible draws the line. That is tightly protected as well. That Christians believe that God is one being in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a Christian and say you don't believe in the, um, um, the, the death of Christ for salvation alone. You know, and so some of some things are clear like that in the Bible. But within that tight, those tight boundaries, there are some things that Christians disagree on. And that's one of the things um, Hadiza has mentioned. So I say all of that to say that regardless of where each and every one of us lands on this position, there has to be some generosity. While we, you know, kind of poke at each other and say, are you sure about this? Are you, are you sure about that? There has to be some generosity knowing that there is freedom for Christians to disagree on these matters. Now, City Church, I mentioned last week, and like we saw again, that there, there are these, when we do our confession of faith, there are 10 statements that we, you know, that we profess. And those things are at the core of our faith. Those things are what it means to be a Christian. But there are some other things that um, if, you are not, if you don't affirm them, you are not, it doesn't mean you are not a Christian, but those are things that we, as a church, as we've reflected on, we believe that this is, what, this is what the Bible's position is. So for instance, we believe that the works of the Holy Spirit continue until the present time. And so we believe that you know, miracles are for today. We believe that God can do great things, as you've heard in the sermon. We believe in um, a system of church governance that is led by the elders that God appoints men to head the congregation, uh, people to head the congregation, and then who direct the affairs of the congregation under Christ. But one of the things we believe is what um, Boli Watife mentioned here, complementarianism or complementarity or, a compl or complementary view of gender. What does that mean? Complementarianism essentially means that we believe God has created male and female equally equally. They are equal in worth. They are equal in value. They, there is no difference from, um, between them before God. So if you remember our Galatians series, one of the things we saw in Galatians 3, 25 to 28, is that God does not make any distinctions based on our ethnicity. God does not make any distinctions based on our gender. Um, but yet the Bible teaches that there is a distinction in roles that God has assigned to males and females. And that distinction plays itself out um, in marriage. And so that's why we believe the Bible teaches that the man leads the home, the man heads the home, not because he's any better, but because that's his job description. Whenever any guy signs up to be husband, he's basically saying, I'm the one, I'm, the, the box stops at my table, that's what it means. But then we also believe, and so many Christians will affirm the first thing that I said, 
But we also believe that that distinction also plays itself out in the church. That the Holy Spirit gives us all equally. The Holy Spirit enables us to serve him in different ways. But that there are differences at the, at the highest level of authority in the church. There are differences in how that is played out. Um, and that is shown from just the, the, the arc of the Bible, for instance. So in Genesis, when God creates the man and the woman, he places them in the garden. But then he says to the man to be the one who is the defender of the garden. And so when um, um, the serpent comes and tempts Eve, one of the disorders that we see in that passage actually is that Adam was just standing by. If you read Genesis 3, Adam was just idly standing by. He didn't take authority. The serpent deceived his wife and the fall came. And so the fall was not even primarily because, you know, they ate whatever food they ate. It was because Adam abdicated. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He abdicated his authority. But God continues, the arc of the Bible is bent towards redemption. And so you begin to see how God is working to redeem the order that he has created, that he has placed there, even though the, the man and the woman have, have disorganized that, they've disobeyed that. And so you come to um, the book of Exodus, Leviticus, where God institutes the uh, priesthood. Very clearly there, he states that the people who, just like Eden, that was a temple before God, that, you know, that was supposed to, the people that were supposed to guard Eden or, and um, guard this new temple, this tabernacle that has been put together, God very clearly said they were the priests and the priests were males. And so we begin to see this order of the guarding of God's household is something that is tied not to any man, but to specific men based on certain kinds of qualifications. That continues to repeat itself all over the Old Testament until we get to the New Testament. And we see that when Christ is calling his apostles, not, not just, you know, um, um, disciples now to follow him, but those who will take on this message and pass it to other people. He's calling men. Not because women can't do that, but because the guarding, part of what it means to be a male, guarding the household of God is something that is tied to gender. Our gender is meant to reflect that. And so the, the, the book of Acts carries on this message. And then you get ultimately to where Paul begins to institute some of the commands of what it means to be an elder or to govern the household of God, what he says very clearly there is that it should be a man who meets certain kinds of qualifications, not just any man, but a man who meets certain kinds of qualifications because just like the family, just like our normal natural family is a household, is a, is a family, the church is also a family that reflects our, um, our subservience, that God is the one ruling over us. And so the, the pastors or the male pastors in a church, we believe the Bible teaches are meant to be male. Should I put a small qualifier on Okay. Done? No, no, so, I'm, I'm not done, but no, you can. No, no, finish up, finish okay. up. So you see there that the Bible says, we believe it's clear that the, the, the leadership of the church, the ultimate leadership of the church is led, governed by men. But yet you see all over the Bible that women are involved in you know, directing the affairs of the church, serving in the church. You mentioned Deborah. Um, Deborah is, you know, directing in Israel. She's giving leadership in Israel. Um, Esther becomes a queen that saves in, in the household in Israel. Um, there's another prophetess that is mentioned, a female prophetess that is mentioned in the Old Testament, prophetess Huda. The word of God comes to her. Um, I think she's a contemporary of Jeremiah, and she brings the word of God as well. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit of God is poured out, it says that sons and daughters will prophesy. So you see again, males and females leading um, or, or serving in the house of God, equally gifted as well. And so the, um, the restriction, as it were, on gender in terms of leading the church of God is not because women are somehow less gifted with the Holy Spirit. It is because the church is meant to illustrate something about um, um, the family of God and how men are meant to guard 
you know, um, the, the family of God and ensure that the church of God is protected, protected against false doctrine, protected against, you know, attacks from the enemy, that kind of thing. And so for us, even though we believe that, yes, men ultimately lead at that highest level of authority, it doesn't carry out to normal society because the society at large is not one that is governed by God. So some people will then say, oh, because we see, um, you know, that men are supposed to lead the house of God, that so a woman can't be president. I don't think so. Because the example you gave again, um, the example of, of Deborah, Deborah was a political leader. She was a judge in Israel. She commanded Barak, who was a soldier, and says, come alongside, let's go into, um, to fight as well. And she gave the prophecy that the, um, the way the victory of the war that they will win will come about was going to come through a woman as well. And you see women serving in all these different roles in, in the Bible. Um, First Corinthians tells us about women being gifted to prophesy, women being gifted to serve in certain roles and to lead in certain capacities in the church. All of that to say that there is a distinction, there is, there is uniformity, there is equal value between male and female in the eyes of God. And yet the Bible calls a certain gender to rule a certain way or uh, to act a certain way in the house of God that he doesn't call the other gender to. Um, and so again, like I said, that's what we, we believe. People who come to City Church, some people don't believe that. We don't think that they're not Christians because of that. Um, but, it's, but it's going to be the lens through which you see um, um, the Church of God in City Church particularly governed and led. I wanted to go yeah. outside the other day, but let yeah, me just... No, no thanks, Emmanuel. I, I was going to, you, you did a, a good job of that. I was going to bring something in from families about servant leadership. The same way that uh, the Bible shows that the relationship between man, a man and a woman in marriage um, reflects sort of the order between Christ and the church. Mm. Um, a man who is in that position of leadership should never at any point, the wife should never at any point in time be able to say, you know, my voice isn't heard or my input or my gift or my whatever is not acknowledged. The job of, the, of the, whoever leads in that uh, family is to serve, is to take all the input and, 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 and do the best with what he has. Mm. But it, again, you're saying the box stops with and I think in City Church, um, we do believe in female leadership. We have female leadership across all the different levels. We're always talking about levels from our gospel communities to you know, service uh, members in, uh, among staff. We have female leaders. And we have uh, continuous, uh, continuous input from uh, those female leaders in, in our church. So at any point in time, a female in City Church should not, should not be able to say that my voice isn't heard or there's something about something specific about my gender or my life that the elders do not, uh, uh, are not considering. Uh, remember also that happened, um, and this is not even about male and female, when, when the widows and the orphans were not being served in the church, they raised their voice and then the elders sort of reconstituted for minority groups. And so we continue to have that. Um, and, um, and yeah, we'll hopefully we'll be able to utilize every gift that everybody, male or female, offers in this church for his goodness and glory. And I think some of the scriptures you could read, uh, Galatians 3, 28, 1 Timothy 2 and 3, Titus 1, where you see where Peter, uh, sorry, where um, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy and to Titus, where he exemplifies the, the uh, conditions of the, of the holders of some of those positions. Okay? So just to also mention that, um, just like a good household, like Uncle Yemi was saying, just like a good household where there is that constant interaction, even though the box stops at the table of the husband, there is that constant interaction between the man and the wife. In many ways in City Church, we have, the leaders have our ears open to say, how can we better serve our sisters in Christ? And so so for, for, for us, sometimes that means that specific discipleship issues are not handled by the men. Because they are, we recognize that there are certain limitations, even though God has called us to lead a certain way, there are certain limitations that we have because of our gender and we cannot disciple our sisters in Christ effectively. And so we have um, a, a women's council, or uh, well, that's what it's called informally. I know they don't like the term. But we have a couple of sisters who, you know, certain specific issues say, oh, how can we better serve this person? Or they say to us, I'm not sure you are paying attention to this kind of thing, you see. So there's that constant back and forth, you know, um, 
as well. And finally, just to, I know I've flogged this a little bit, but just to say on Boluati first question, how, I can speak for myself, how did, how did you come to that understanding? I think it's being willing to have our views challenged. Um, like I was saying, there are some things that we should hold tightly to, but there are some things that are, so those are, those are first order doctrines or principles, but there are some things that are not first order doctrines or principles, and we should constantly have our motives, our beliefs challenged against the word of God and say, am I sure that this is you know, what the word of God teaches, even though it's not popular, even though it's, you know, it's not right, um, and we humbly submit to the word of God. And so I think in a nutshell, I would say, for myself and um, the other leaders on the leadership team, I think that's essentially how it came about, how, allowing the word of God to challenge our views and being generous to those that we disagree with or who disagree with us. Thanks, man. I would say the same for me. A question on baptism. I want to take that. Baptism doesn't say, but scripture commands it. Um, okay, this one is a is a is a is one that um, people usually talk about in, in different circles. And so the question is, baptism doesn't say, but Bible commands it. And yet, in certain Bible passages, you feel like the Bible is saying you cannot be a Christian or you cannot. Um, let me let me use the exact words that the person used. Um, he says, in what sense is it efficacious? And so pa Bible passages say it is almost as though we are saved by baptism. And he quotes 1 Peter 3.21, baptism saves us, and John 3.5. Let me start with John 3.5. John 3.5 is in the context of Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And so what's happening there is that Nicodemus has visited Jesus in the middle of the night, and then Nicodemus says, we know that no one, no one can do these things except God is with him. And then Jesus says that um, no one can enter the kingdom of God except a man is born again. And then Nicodemus then asks, how can a man be born again? Jesus replies, except he is born of water and spirit. And so a lot of people take that to mean, oh, he's talking about speaking in tongues, and he's talking about um, baptism in water. I don't think that's the right interpretation. I don't think that's the right interpretation because what Jesus is doing in that passage is that Jesus is, like Jesus does with a lot of his interactions with Jewish teachers, Jesus is taking something from the, um, from the story of Israel, what has happened in the Old Testament, and he's using it to instruct the person in front of him. And so what Jesus is doing in that passage, talking about being born of the Spirit, he's alluding to, um, he's alluding to Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Eli, um, Ezekiel has a, a vision where he's in the valley of dry bones and there is, you know, it seems like there's so much deadness around him. And God asks him if these bones can live and Ezekiel says basically, God, only you know. And then God says, prophesy to these bones. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, the bones come to life. By the power of the Spirit, the bones come to life and as a word, there is a rebirth. And so when Jesus talks to um, um, Nicodemus, he's quoting that to say, being born again is not something that is accomplished by our own human efforts. It is accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's not talking there about baptism in water. He's not talking there about um, speaking in tongues. You know, he's talking about what the Holy Spirit alone can do. That's what he's talking about. So when Nicodemus then piggy, piggybacks and says, oh, am I going to enter into my mother's womb again? He says, are you not a teacher of Israel? Do you not know these things? You see, he's bringing um, Nicodemus's mind back to what God had already said in the Old Testament. So that's not, that passage is not about baptism in water. But then the one that I think um, hangs us up a lot more is that First Peter 3, where Peter is writing to um, believers who are in exile or believers who are expressing a hard time. And then he begins to, from around verse 18 to, to the end, He's talking about, he makes an allusion to Noah and the um, ark and how there was a visitation and how God's word actually came to people in the time of Noah. And then he says, baptism which is like that now saves you. Um, now that passage is one of the really difficult passages of the Bible and we've talked about that at, at um, different times. I think it still came up like two or three months ago. So I won't flog that too much. 
um, we've in, in our sermon series in Colossians, pastor preached a sermon about baptism, so I'd encourage you to go and look at, at that. But he's not talking in that passage about baptism in terms of um, um, baptism saving us. He's talking about baptism as a sign that we have been saved. Baptism as a sign that we have been saved. Some, something like the way people wear rings. You know, now there's many people wear rings. Rings are not... Um, you know, rings are not what confer on you the status of being married. Rather, the ring shows that something has happened to you. It's a sign of something that has happened to you. And so that's what Peter is talking about there, that the baptism that we've received is a sign that we have been saved and we will be saved ultimately. We've been delivered from the judgment that awaits us. Yeah, in fact, some two translations, one calls it uh, the symbol of what saves, and one calls it the pledge of, and in that same scripture, talks about the pledge of a good conscience. So the ring uh, symbolism is appropriate, and the water symbolizing um, uh, what happened on the, when you got saved, when you were baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Um, that's what it says. Again, the series is called Rooted and Built Up 2019 series on Colossians. Rooted and Built yeah, Up yeah. is a much more extensive treatment on, of baptism. So yeah. I hope that helps. Any more questions? Um, there is one. Oh, the one on sermon. Is that the last one? That's the last yeah. one. Okay. I'll take that finally. So um, I made a statement. So maybe just to correct a little bit of that. So I, I, I didn't say um, prayerlessness equals powerlessness. Um, I said we are powerless because we are prayerless. I know it sounds like I'm arguing over words, but no, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a fine difference. There's a fine difference. The difference is that the statement like I made during the service and like I tried to show is that our prayers are the means through which God sometimes chooses to exercise his sovereignty. So you're right, there are many things that we don't pray about and you know, God still causes to bring about. For instance, I didn't pray that day will break today. Many of us didn't pray that day will break today and yet God still brought it about. So it's not to say that our prayers somehow commandeer God to do things that he doesn't want to do anyway. But it is recognizing, you know, as we see in the Bible, that God chooses. God sometimes chooses, most times actually, even chooses to walk through the prayers of his people. And so in Luke 18, um, Jesus quotes, Jesus tells a parable. And, you know, the, it begins in verse 1 by saying, Jesus told this parable so that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And this is the Jesus who, you know, does like he can do anything he wants, but he's trying to make a statement to us, or he's rather making a statement to us to show that there is a correlation between how much of God we're experiencing and how much we are devoting ourselves to prayer. And so that parable ends in verse 8 to say, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And so we actually demonstrate our faith in the sovereign God by constantly praying. Like, so prayer and, you know, the sovereignty of God are not at odds with, with each other. And you, you see this in the life of Jesus Christ himself. Like I always marvel any time I read the book of Mark. Mark makes all these insertions throughout the book. Mark 135, different places that Jesus will rise up early in the morning and he will go and pray. And I'm wondering why? Why? Like, like if there's anybody who never had a dry spiritual life, it is Jesus. If there's anybody who never had a prayer unanswered, it is Jesus. Why? What is he praying about? He's showing us that there is, there is no disconnect between the sovereignty of God and our prayers. And rather, we, we demonstrate that we believe in him by how much we give ourselves to prayer. I, I hope that helps. And we can talk about it a little bit more if, if you want. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. Everyone. Until next time, have a great week. Have a great week. <laughs>